Britain, uh, is available through the Riga Business School. Uh, and so you would contact um, the Riga Business School to get a hold of this uh, for later use. Uh, so let me go ahead and share the screen. Um, and we'll share the screen. There we go. So um, it's a pretty uh, self-explanatory slide, how to present your idea. But I want to emphasize that if you follow these tips, then you're going to succeed in your presentation. Um, I've found that uh, many people uh, that uh, begin startups uh, will get a bit bravado and kind of go, oh, I know what I'm doing. Uh, but there are certain steps and tips that if you don't exercise them, you probably are going to miss out on uh, some money uh, or some assistance uh, that you have. So I want to just kind of start off by a, a little quote that says, stimulate interest not to cover all the aspects of your startup and bludgeon your audience into submission. You're always hoping to get a second meeting. The reason I underlined that last kind of um, uh, bit is it's the first meeting that you will always get. People will uh, oblige you. Uh, they will smile and they'll say, sure, we'll sit through anything. <laughs> It's the second meeting that you really are uh, looking for. And this is very, very important when we're um, in the process of expanding a product line uh, or a service line, and then eventually raising funds. So it's that second meeting that, that really is the foundation for today's uh, presentation. So you need um, basically 10 slides. Uh, I know that this is uh, really an incredibly small number of um, slides, uh, and it really forces you uh, and potentially your partner to really think about your product and your service, um, your people, and what you want to do going forward. A lot of folks have real issues with um, only, for instance, 10 slides, uh, but uh, this really does allow for um, a good conversation after uh, your presentation. Now, remember, you can always add slides, but you never really want to add more than about five slides for a total of 15. Um, 15 slides is going to, at about two minutes um, per slide, is a 30-minute meeting, and no one wants to sit um, down and listen to somebody for more than 30 minutes on a brand new idea. They just can't absorb it. So keep this formula in mind. The more slides you need to express your idea, the less compelling your idea is for the listener. Now, I say this um, because I've sat through uh, presentations, pitches, if you will, uh, where uh, we've had to endure 25, 30, 35 slides, and in the end, um, basically, they were trying to sell the idea of uh, a new kind of rubber ducky. Uh, it's the, the idea was never uh, compelling in the first place, and they uh, killed us with a number of slides. So let's go through those 10 slides. Um, again, as I mentioned at the outset, it is um, uh, permissible for you to use this presentation uh, to guide you through your presentations uh, as you go forward. So your first slide is your title slide, pretty straightforward, but you want to keep this simple. You want to have your company name, your name and title, the company address, the main email address that you'll accept correspondence to, and of course, your primary mobile phone number. It's very, very important. We um, live in an era where the mobile phone is um, extremely important. If you're successful in the first meeting, this particular slide is going to be the takeaway sheet 
uh, and they're going to get back to you. So you want to make sure that this is complete, but you don't have any other extraneous information. The next slide is um, really kind of setting everything up. What is the problem? What is the opportunity? You want, to, you want to make sure that you describe the pain that you're taking care of with your idea or the pleasure you're providing. Um, this slide will establish both your financial needs and desires as well as indicate to the listener how deep you've thought about this problem or opportunity. Now, you're not actually talking about money in this slide, but your passion comes through and will give you the ability to project a well-founded um, idea and therefore uh, the need for a particular amount of money. They'll get the picture. The third slide is your value proposition. Explain the value of, your, of the pain that you're taking care of with your idea or the value of your pleasure. Um, tell the listener where you place value uh, and at what level. And by defining your value system, you will also give credence to your eventual financial requirements. When we talk about value, we're not talking about just money. We're talking about community. We're talking about the extension of um, help or assistance. Uh, you know, what is your uh, application, your product, your service going to do for somebody? Is it going to make them happy and at what level? So this is where you really are kind of pouring your heart out uh, to um, the uh, listener, him or herself. What's the magic? In this particular case, we actually haven't talked about the process of your product or service, and this is where you bring it in. You want to describe the technology, very short and sweet, the secret sauce, or the simple magic behind your product or service. Uh, I can think of many uh, products and services, but I'm going to bring up the one that um, is uh, fairly universal. You can like it or not like it, but Facebook. I would say that the underlying magic there is that it provides a community platform um, regardless of location on the planet. Pretty simple. The less text you use and the more diagrams, schematics, and flowcharts, the better. People love pictures. So keep that in mind. And if you have a prototype of your particular um, product or you can demonstrate the service, then now is the time to bring out and demo that. Keep the demo at about five minutes. The business model um, Essentially, we're not talking about um, uh, we're not talking about SWOT analysis and kind of your BBA program um, courses that you've uh, uh, delved into um, during the term. What we're really talking about is in this particular slide is explain who has your money, customers, and who's going to or how are you going to get their money? <laughs> what are the steps involved? You want to make sure that this slide talks at a conversational level. Um, and, and we want to make sure that uh, the person listening to your story uh, understands kind of the simple steps in your business model. So there's no need to get really deep uh, into uh, the business uh, vocabulary, formulas, etc., we're really talking about a conversation here. And this is a good time to insert a timeline chart. Um, and you would insert it right after this particular business model. And uh, you want to make sure that uh, this timeline chart uh, is both um, useful to you and available to your listener. because. Uh, it will be required uh, at your second and third meetings. Remember, our initial goal this afternoon is to get that second meeting. Go to market plan. 
you want to make sure that you are going to reach your customer base. How is it that you're going to um, have that conversation with your customer? Are you going to do it by email? Are you going to do it by social media, um, specifically Pinterest or Facebook or LinkedIn or various other European-based uh, or oriented platforms? Um, and, and essentially, how are you going to reach your customer base without breaking the bank? This is going to be an important um, point that you'll need to explain to anybody listening because they're interested in how much it's going to cost to reach your customer base. Never suggest that you'll be spending borrowed money, by the way. Don't go into the, in the to a first meeting and, of course, the second meeting by indicating, oh, yes, I took out a loan uh, against my flat or my parents or my uh, friends co-signed a loan. That's not a good way to start off the conversation. Now, you may have to do a loan down the way, and then we'll talk about that later. But uh, in terms of this go-to-market plan, you really want to talk about reach in an inexpensive manner. You can also add your definition of what the customer base looks like. What does your customer um, actually look like? Is he or she uh, 18 to 24? Um, are they all left-handed? Uh, do they have Android phones? Uh, do they all live in Estonia or Poland or Latvia? Um, all of these kind of uh, bits and pieces uh, tell the listener what kind of customer base you're actually considering. Uh, and if you indicate, for example, uh, that my customer base, my initial customer base will be in the Baltics, your listener, potentially an investor, might come back and say, very good thoughts, um, but within six months, you really need to branch out to other locations in uh, Europe and possibly Scandinavia. So they're already thinking six months, 12 months down the road based on your definition of what a customer looks like. What's the competitive analysis? Now, this is a little bit of uh, business um, uh, wonkery here. You want to make sure that you provide a complete view of the competition and the competitive landscape. Now, a lot of people um, give me pushback and say, no one has ever done this product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, I understand. The problem is, is that somebody has come up with something that prompted you to make, if you will, a better mousetrap. Um, a better version of what's already on the market. Yes, in fact, it, your product may specifically not be on the uh, market at this time. But uh, in the case of last year's Latvian team, um, two lovely ladies um, put together a child's raincoat. Well, the concept of a raincoat has been around for a long, long time. The way they approached the raincoat and the type of engineering that went into these um, children's um, uh, kind of high-tech uh, raincoats was a wonderful alternative to the marketplace. But they needed, as well as you, need to look at what your competition is. If you're dealing with, uh, for instance, um, and I'll give you another example that uh, is prime here in the Bay Area, and that's Uber. Very, very early on with Uber, uh, they said this is going to revolutionize the um, impromptu and scheduled transportation of people. Um, and a lot of uh, would-be investors scratched their head and said, yeah, there's this thing called a taxi cab. Well, they understood the taxi cab concept. They understood mass transit, uh, the metro, uh, buses. 
but they did not recognize any of these competitions, if you will, uh, inside of their presentation for the Uber application. And so they stumbled in the beginning. It was very interesting. Uh, and then, of course, they've come back and, and uh, embraced these particular areas. This is also where you want to begin citing secondary sources. What are other people in the industry saying about this little niche that you want to get involved with? If I'm listening to your presentation, I want to know who else is talking about uh, raincoats uh, in the clothing industry. Is there an industry um, association that has a research site? Uh, is there uh, already information out there on um, the types of material that potentially could be used to uh, make a particular uh, new style of raincoat? And so this allows the listener to look at you and say they've done their homework. I just finished a project uh, that uh, dealt with um, a uh, uh, bitcoins, uh, I should say, um, cryptocurrency, and the ICO um, uh, happened and uh, fairly successful. Uh, and in this particular case, um, we went out of our way to go and look at Forbes magazine, uh, The Economist, um, uh, various. Um, um, uh, financial sources uh, throughout Europe and the United States and Canada and Asia. Uh, we looked at, we got uh, one particular um, uh, nice article about cryptocurrency in Africa, uh, written out of South Africa. Um, and we placed all this in a uh, particular slide. And when we presented it to some investors, potential investors, uh, they were all very impressed because they knew these publications. Uh, this wasn't us talking about uh, ICOs or cryptocurrency. This was other people, uh, people in the media industry uh, who've done their uh, research. And so uh, I want to make sure that everybody understands that this is not very sexy, but spend a couple of hours and go through sources like scholar.google.com and put in your idea, your, your product, your service, and find out who's also done some research on that. Um, so let's go to the management team. Now, I know a lot of you are looking at each other smiling, going, the management team is myself and my brother, <laughs> or my girlfriend, or my boyfriend, or just me. Yes, we know this. And um, every small uh, startup uh, is in the same boat. But I put this up here so that it prompts you to actually think about all the elements that an investor, uh, that uh, investors, would want to see over time. You want to out, outline the entire management team. And right at the moment, it may be just you, or it may be you and your um, best friends. So um, Sally and Juanita, uh, you know, CEO and COO, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, and people understand that, but they want to see what the beginnings of your organizational chart are. They want to see your board of directors. Now you're scratching your head right at the moment going, board of directors? Well, I, I only, I'm, I'm trying to sell this midget. Yes. Uh, so you may want to actually start out with a board of advisors. These do not have to have financial implications right up front, nor do they have to be actual investors, but they would be people who are, um, who you can uh, lean on for uh, immediate advice that can review another set of eyes uh, reviewing your product over uh, the course of its history uh, and talk about any investors that you may have on board right now. And this means um, your dad 
who just gave you 250 euros to kind of start, or your uncle who just um, uh, gave you a thousand euros to get started. These are investors just like anybody else, all the way up through banks and venture capital firms. So in this, I want to stop here just very um, briefly and talk about, for instance, the board of advisors. I sit on three board um, of advisor um, entities uh, here in Silicon Valley uh, for startups. These are uh, friends or friends of friends. Um, I've listened to their pitch, their um, presentation of their ideas, and uh, we hit it off. There was good chemistry. And so we had um, kind of a love affair, if you will, uh, with the product or service. Uh, and so I was genuinely interested in um, taking a more active role in that startup. They, in turn, wanted to make sure that they get, could get some people that were genuinely smart uh, and understood the startup environment so that they didn't have to stumble too often. Uh, and so uh, I sit on these boards uh, we meet usually about once a month. Um, uh, many times it's over Skype uh, or in this case, Zoom. Uh, sometimes it's in person. And in this particular case, uh, they bring up ideas. Hey, we were thinking about adding a button here or changing the color there, or we'd like to spend an additional $1,000 uh, for marketing at this show that's coming up. So the board of advisors um, kind of sits back and says, good path, cut it down to $500. You should see a return on investment uh, within blah, 60 days, 90 days. And so the board of advisors is that extra set of eyes. Keep that in mind uh, and don't uh, kind of blow that off. These are not people that want to overtake your business. These are people who are genuinely interested in seeing that you are successful. Now, the last bullet here is to recognize that it's okay to have gaps in the team. But you need to talk about these gaps and how they'll be addressed. So in this particular case, if it's just you and uh, Juanita, uh, on the team and you've got a little product that you are trying to um, put together, you need to talk about the idea of logistics will be, uh, a logistics person will be hired um, within three months. A marketing person will be hired within four months. The board of advisors will be formed uh, within the next 60 days. Uh, all of these are on that timeline I talked about earlier. And anybody that's listening to this is going to kind of sit back, smile, and kind of go, these people understand the process. Good. I like what I see. You want to make sure that that person feels comfortable with everything about your product, service, and your um, process going forward. Ah, now we get to the nitty gritty. Um, so in this particular case, financial projections. I know many of you are kind of looking at this slide going, wait a minute, uh, I'm going to fit everything, all my finances on one page? Yes. You're going to keep it simple because you're really going for the second meeting. On this slide, you want to work in threes. You want to provide just a real basic three-year budget forecast for your product or service. I'm not talking about quarterly. I'm talking about, you could do quarterly, but you could talk about three years. In the first year, we will, um, our sales should reach uh, 25,000 euros. In year two, our projected um, uh, revenue should be about 80,000 euros. And in year three, we expect to exceed a quarter million euros for that third year. Now, 
everybody understands that you're just beginning. So how can you even talk about a quarter million euros um, in three years? That's a little bit crazy. But this idea that you're at least thinking down the road um, does um, add credence to uh, something that uh, people are worried about from the beginning. In addition, going back to the working in threes, you want to make sure that you always talk about quarterly this or that. And again, this is three months. So there are four quarters in a year, and uh, nobody really wants to talk about month to month or week to week. Though in many cases, you may be living week to week in terms of your financial cash flow. Um, the second bullet here uh, is that you should highlight the metrics, including potential customers and your con customer conversion rate. So let me speak just briefly about this. You want to make sure that um, your that this slide really talks about how many realistic customers you're going to be able to a approach and b then get to purchase your product. Now it's one thing to say, "Yeah, so I want a million customers." Well, that's great, but what's the conversion rate of those million customers? If it's 1%, you're doing well, but no one in their right mind is actually going to believe a million customers. So realistically, if you've already talked about, for instance, the geography, and we're going to start this uh, product or service in the Baltics, just as an example, then we know basically the numbers of potential people in the Baltics by themselves already. Now you can go from that number to a larger number down the road, but you really have to prove yourself in the beginning. And then finally, there's no need to project large, crazy num numbers. No one is going to be impressed. I can't emphasize that enough. They want realistic numbers. And I can tell you that a good investor um, and a good board of directors or a board of advisor member is can smell cookbooks from a thousand kilometers away. If you put in large, crazy numbers, that tells somebody like myself that you really haven't thought about what your customer base looks like. You really haven't thought about really your financial projections very well, uh, that you're really kind of just throwing things out there uh, that um, to, to impress people. And I can tell you from experience, I'm never impressed with really large numbers. In fact, I'm more impressed with really, really small numbers that grow over some amount of time because that tells me that you really are concentrating on a key customer niche and that you're going to grow it from that point, that your passion shows. And then the final slide is um, what is your current status accomplishments and the use of funds? Now, again, this is one of those slides that you're scratching your head going, how can I get all of this stuff on one slide? Force yourself. Bullets. I've got three bullets right here. Same thing goes for your presentation. You want to explain the current status of your product or service. We're in demo and we expect to be in the demo mode. Um, or prototype mode for the next 90 days. After 90 days, we will have a proof of concept uh, product available for use by uh, beta customers. Tell the um, listener what you've accomplished. Uh, we have submitted uh, three patent applications uh, to the European Patent uh, Office and that we are hitting all of our um, uh, designated timeline targets on a regular basis. Now, that tells me that you are really um, a mature uh, or a maturing business. And this is important for somebody who wants to give some money away. Finally, tell them that you're using the money for what you're trying to raise. Do not list out 300 euros for a printer. No one cares about that level of detail. You need to speak in broader terms. We'd like to utilize 
10% of our money for marketing, 15% of our money um, uh, for, from whatever money we raise in research and development, 25% in actual production of 1.0, and 25% in reserve, and 25% in uh, personnel. Boom. Nice, um, um, easily understood percentages of a pie that you don't even know what actually it's going to be. Because at this point, you don't know if you're going to get 10,000 uh, euros or 100,000 euros. That's, that's a very, very important um, concept that people uh, don't accept. Finally, liquidity. No one knows when you're going to achieve liquidity. Trust me. You may reach the point earlier or it may never come at all. But here's a word to the wise, and I'd like everybody to memorize this kind of red little paragraph. Never have a slide that states, we have two liquidity options, IPO or acquisition. A savvy investor already knows this. Anybody who's ever done any investing at all already understands this particular concept. You don't need to tell them. And if you ask that, um, or if they ask you the question, what are your um, liquidity options, then they are not seasoned investors, and I would be wary of them. So if it's your dad or your uncle, okay, I can, I can understand that they may want to kind of know and they need to be educated. But if you have somebody come up and going, yes, I'm an investor, what are your um, liquidity options? I would step back kind of going, where else have you invested? Because this is important that a person who has not invested a lot tends to get very, very involved in some of these startups and sometimes ruin the startups. That's real important to, to um, uh, recognize is that somebody who's investing in you needs to stand back just a little bit. So we're at the end here. I'm going to take some questions. Uh, but I'd first, before I leave, um, I want to make sure that I'm accessible to uh, people who'd like to ask me additional questions offline. You can Skype if you'd like to do that. Uh, there's my Skype uh, name, Pacifica Mobile. My mobile phone number is this, and uh, I text and use WhatsApp uh, on a regular basis. And, of course, my email address, uh, and you can see my Pacific Ocean Orientation South Pacific uh, is right there. And so you can write me uh, anytime that you would like. So um, I, uh, I can't thank you enough. We're at the uh, kind of uh, tail end of my formal presentation, uh, but I'm going to turn it over to Claudio so we can take some questions if you have them. Um, but thank you very, very much for this opportunity. Claudio? Yeah, Peter, thank you. Thank you so much. It was a great presentation. I have a few questions. But before I, 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 I do those questions to you, Peter, yes, I want to remind the audience that by the end of the <laughs> webinar, you, ca you will have a link to a quiz the, with four questions, okay, <coughs> where you have in each question, you have four options. And if you complete the quiz properly, it, it means you need to have at least three of the questions right. So then you will have your first Riga Business School Junior Achievement Latvia uh, certificate of successful participation in this webinar. So y the quiz will be available till tomorrow, 9 a.m. Latvian time. Okay, so Latvian time for those that are not in Latvia is GMT plus two. The certificate you will receive it uh, over email in a week time. So tomorrow, so you have time till tomorrow at 9 a.m. to fill the quiz and then uh, we will check out your answers and then in a week time you will receive the certificate. Okay. So you, before you fill the quiz, you can go over the presentation again as it will be available in uh, our YouTube channel. Okay, Peter, I have the first question, though you a little bit touch upon this. Uh, during the presentation, but which are the most usual mistakes you have, you still see 
in some presentation by you know new startups fir first time sort of sure. uh, a, a startup founder uh, there's probably three mistakes that happen over and over again. The first is that people come in with very large egos. They understand, they think they understand the problem. They think that they have the solution and they make sure and tell you that they know everything. And so um, I sit there and just kind of smile and kind of go, there's been a lot of people before you, my friend. So that's the first. The second is, is that they over project um, the number of sales that they will have. Um, this also has a little bit to do with uh, the ego, but also they didn't do their homework uh, in the region, for example. So if you're really talking about selling raincoats in the Baltics, um, then there are some finite numbers there and anything above that is going to um, uh, not do well. The third area uh, is um, an unrealistic uh, use of money. Uh, we're going to, you know, all we need is 5% for marketing. And if this is a new kind of um, app, for example, um, I see this with app uh, startups, uh, marketing is very, very important. We just know that in the industry. And so uh, they don't understand when they come and say, yeah, it's 5% for marketing, that they have not done their homework in terms of uh, the way they roll this out. You're very specific, guys. So the, the second question is a little bit more practical or concrete. Uh, is how important are visual effects design in the presentation? So in the PowerPoint presentation, I mean the proportion between text and design. So wh what investor usually like to see? Sure. So first of all, as I mentioned before in one of my um, early slides, um, less text, more pictures. Um, but keep the picture simple. You can use icons and these kinds of things. You don't need to have lots of detailed photography. But you don't want to go overboard because what are you trying to sell? The, the graphics or your product? And so that's the balance needs to. But here's a good way to, to check and uh, to see if you're on, you know, in line with the presentation. And that is go take it to your mother. Show your mother the presentation, and if your mother looks at it and then has some business-type questions at the end, you've succeeded. If your mother starts commenting about the color peach and the nice, pretty little bird floating across the top of your presentation, then you have failed. <laughs> Peter, I, as, as the audience is a high school audience, um, we got a question that um, that I think is important to clarify. Uh, you talk about IPO. So the question is, what does IPO mean? Ah, initial public offering. So when somebody wants to um, take it to the next step from investors to the more general public, they're going to have um, an IPO, an initial public offering of stock. It's usually through a stock exchange of some sort. Uh, we think uh, here in the United States is the New York Stock Exchange, uh, but there are actually several hundred different exchanges around the world. Uh, and you set a particular price per share. Uh, and at that point, you put it out on a particular day and hopefully the public goes wild and buys your uh, stock up. Uh, and so that's what investors like also. <laughs> One more question that is very connected with the design issues that you were talking about. It's a little bit more specific. And actually we, we talk this over with the rainy art presentation last year. Please, what about the colors of the presentation? I mean, the background, the col, the, the 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 color. Which do you prefer people to use more light color, more dark color? What what could you comment about it? Yeah, so um, I'm not an artist by training, <laughs> but um, I know basically what I like. And uh, if you keep it to ten, maybe twelve slides, I would say that keep your color schema consistent. Now, that wasn't your question. Should it be light or dark? If you're going to use kind of darker tones, 
just keep it consistent from slide one to slide 12. If you're going to use uh, light colors, don't go light, 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 dark, dark, light, 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 dark, dark. That is visually a confusing um, uh, element. But I would um, tend to go with white background. White background is visually a non um, a disturbing uh, or destructive kind of uh, color, if you will, and that I would apply the colors that we're talking about to logos, to potential text, uh, to other graphic swaths across uh, the particular PowerPoint slideshow. But a nice white background is always uh, a very nice effect. If I may, uh, I, I think nobody in the team is a designer. It might make sense to to get a hand of a designer that can actually look at the presentation and improve it, right? At least it works for me, <laughs> but yeah. I think it works for everybody, right? Uh, yeah. It makes presentation look more professional. Well, and, and here's the other part, um, and this is where I've, I've kicked in as a, um, a member of a board of advisors for a particular startup is that when they were going out to um, angel investors, I said, give me your um, pitch deck. Give me your idea presentation before you take it to anybody else. And I sat there in my room and played it up on my big screen before um, they took it on the road, if you will. So that's where your board of advisors really kind of come in and are handy. They're an extra set of eyes. And so... I've had uh, many a presentation changed because I was the extra set of eyes and caught this or that, a spelling mistake, uh, conflicting colors, uh, etc. So utilize people around you and don't, um, even if you have a designer on your team, use people around you as another set of eyes. Question here, and we are running out of time already. So maybe this is going to be two, two more, and maybe let's try. We will right. try to keep it very short. So one is uh, the most of the products the the, the, the viewers are going to present are techno technological based. I mean, some way or other. So there sure. are, there is technology there, and most of the people will talk to them, and the investor uh, they are, that are going to listen their presentations. They are really not familiar with the technology. So how how they how do you suggest them to to talk about the technological part? That uh, I mean they don't have the time to explain everything, but they have to show that it works. So how, what do you suggest in that sense? Well, there's a couple of things, and I know that we're short on time here, but um, there's there's two techniques that I want to impart on everybody. First of all. The technologies that, that are coming up and brewing in the startups today came from somewhere. So in the case of um, Taxify, uh, Taxify in Latvia, that particular app, the presentation that I saw actually started with the concept of calling a taxi cab. Real basic technology to get everybody kind of on the same sheet of music, if you will, to understand the concept of um, working with a taxi cab. Then they went to how does the phone then work as a platform to now, instead of calling, texting, etc. Uh, and then they took it one step further and said, here's how it can be, you can pay or use the locator for. And so they incrementally um, expose the listener, the investor, um, the various steps in the technology rather than kind of throwing it all out at once. And so I would suggest incremental and talk about the history a little bit, just a little bit. Last question. Yes, John, and we, we, we will finish for today. But I mean, the business plan, uh, I mean, sometimes investors or people that come to see a presentation have been uh, have familiarized with the business plan before. How important uh, it is? I mean, I is something still relevant for investors, or they rely more on the presentations and the Excel files where you have maybe your numbers? 
So in the past, I remember you have to write long business plans. Does it really an important tool still today, or business plans are not anymore something important? No, and I'll, again, I'll keep this short, but this is almost a semester-long course, your question. <laughs> business plans are important, period. They are important. And the longer ones um, really are a reflection of the complexity of a product or service, and the amount of money that you are going uh, after. If you're going after a thousand euros, your business plan needs to really fit on one page. If you're going for a million euros, your business plan had to ha ha better have be um, very comprehensive and uh, really then talking about 10 to 15 pages. Now that said, the business plan that I'm talking about here is the, the one sheet, the one slide that kind of covers the business plan in a conversational mode um, for the first meeting. If you get the second meeting, and this is very important for everybody listening, if you get that second meeting like, hey, you know what? I like your product. Can we meet next week again? You should kind of, as soon as they leave the room, you should do a happy dance because that's what you want is the second meeting. That's where your business plan fitting on one PowerPoint slideshow then needs to evolve into at least two, maybe three pages of more detail. But right in the beginning, no, you don't need a real detailed business plan. Um, you need one for the second and third meeting, not the first meeting. Very good. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, now we are going to, we're going to close. Uh, uh, we really also thank you to all the participants and remember you have time to watch again this webinar in our Riga Business School channel and then to fill the quiz and then get if if you get three out of four questions right so then you can get our certificate as well that any certificate is important especially at your age okay and we are very looking forward to see you again uh, in February, where we will have the second webinar. We will have a third one in March. And um, of course, we will, be, we will love to see you here in Riga Business School in Latvia, where we have this amazing school with a dual degree pro program with uh, the, the New York State University at Buffalo. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, everybody. Thank you very, very much.